everybody is stuck. Like literally everybody is just – they're stuck at their house. They're sheltering in place You know, when everything was shutting down. Um, that means pretty much everybody that I would ever want to send an unsolicited care package to is going to be at home probably. And I, I sent some T-shirts to Conan O'Brien, um, not you know, not expecting really anything. I think I thought maybe best case I'd see him wearing one in an Instagram story or something fleeting. You know, I sent this this shirt and and a few other things, and and then all of a sudden it popped up in one of his uh, monologues on one of his filmed from home episodes, and he just made fun of it. And what he said. You know, Sully's, if you wanted to remind me of my childhood, send me a T-shirt of my dad knocking a hot dog out of my hand because Jim Rice missed a fly ball. I I pieced it together into a T-shirt and then printed some the next day and next day aired it to Conan O'Brien. And within uh, within an hour of it receiving of him receiving it at his house, he he emailed me through his assistant and was just blown away. He was like, I can't, I, I can't believe you made this. I, I, how do you know what my dad looked like? Because it's perfect. Hey, welcome to episode three of the Codec Projects podcast. For this episode, I talked to Chris Ray. You may know him from Bridge Nine Records, but there's a lot more to him than that. Over the years, Chris has proved himself to be an incredible guerrilla marketer and a great entrepreneur. Over the past 25 years, he's managed to be successful while maintaining his core values, and that's obvious even to the most casual observer. This is why I selfishly asked him to be part of the Don't Stand in Line docuseries. We touch on Don't Stand in Line a bit here, but we also go into many other areas and some of the interesting things he's been doing since filming wrapped in the spring of 2019. So here's Chris. We're talking to Chris Ren of Bridge Nine Records and Sully's brand, and uh, Chris, for anyone who might not know, just give a quick little intro about who you are and, and what you do. Okay, well, um, thank you, Anthony. My name is Chris Wren. Um, as you mentioned, I, I run Bridge Nine Records and Sully's brand uh, here in Peabody, Massachusetts. Um, Bridge Nine's in its 25th year as a label, and Sully's is in its 20th year as a brand. And I kind of try and bounce between the two and, and try and keep them both going. That's a long time. Like, Which came first and what motivated you to start? So the label came first. I was in college. You know, I wanted to be more involved in the the local hardcore scene. I had moved away from my hometown and I saw starting a label or at least releasing a a seven inch single with some of my friends bands as a kind of a way to stay connected. So I I started that. Um, No real aspirations of, of really starting a label, but just, just to kind of do something right. You know, at that time in the mid nineties, most of the people that I knew were very involved on some level in the, in hardcore and punk. They were either in bands, they did fanzines. There was a kid in my high school that did a distro literally out of his backpack. Um, you know, he would make flyers with all the records that he, he had available and, and would hand them out and then bring them into school. Um, People took photos, did, you know, did fanzines, book shows. So putting out a record was just kind of the way that I saw for for me to contribute. That's awesome, dude. You know, I know the answer to these questions, but uh, I don't know that everyone out there does know. So how did Sully's come about? Like, what was the what was the spark for that? So most people, it's funny, most people don't really know the connection between the two. I've talked about it a little bit more recently, um, but for for years, it kind of, you know, there, you'd have people that had both Sully's t-shirts and listened to Bridge Nine Bands, but had no idea that both of those things were coming out of the same office. Um, wow. So Sully started originally just as an ends to a means I was trying to get the label a little bit more active. I was trying to put out more than one record a year, which was kind of the pattern I was in from like 96 through, you know, into 2000. And at the time, you know, back in 99, when this was kind of starting to come together into 2000, I was working at Tower Records. I was working as an artist in their art department, making just a little bit above minimum wage, living in a apartment with, you know, three other dudes and 
not really having any extra money outside of, you know, whatever I needed to survive. So to, to invest in the label, cause back then, certainly not now, but I mean, back then there was, there was no, there was no, uh, crowdfunding, you know, there was no, um, GoFundMe or anything online to kind of pull money in from fans. I mean, I didn't have fans to begin with. So, you know, there was, there was no money coming from family or inheritances or whatever. And banks weren't giving out loans to people that wanted to put out punk rock records. So it was trying to find a way to earn money outside of what I was doing to invest in the label was what I had really been focusing on. Um, I was selling bumper stickers that I would design to hot topic. Um, you know, a friend of mine worked as a manager at one of the stores in Connecticut. And I remember going in, I was hanging out with him after he got out of work and I was, I was went into the store to wait for him to finish up. And I was looking at all the bumper stickers that were in these display cases at the counter. And a lot of them were really corny and very simple and just black and white. And I was thinking to myself, I can make these. So he got me a phone number for somebody at their corporate office. I came up with a couple of different designs that were loosely subculture based, but, you know, just kind of like pop culture things and sent them, you know, uh, samples and, and just honestly just printouts of what they would be. And they started buying them and they bought thousands of them. And that's how the first, you know, I think the third and fourth release that Bridge Nine put out, I was able to pay for those because I was making money um, selling these bumper stickers to Hot Topic. So, you know, when when Tenure of Fight, when you're, you know, when your band was playing the final show and Yankee Suck was such a huge thing around the stadium, um, both through mutual friends that were were doing stuff and just, I mean, that was the phrase that everyone was chanting, you know, whether or not the Yankees were playing at, at Fenway. Um, there was an opportunity to start making bumper stickers at first and just go and pedal them to people leaving the stadium. I mean, Fenway Park has 38,000 people going into, you know, the stadium for every game night. And I mean, when you have 38,000 people there, you know, in one place at one time, there's, there's an opportunity there. So I started making bumper stickers that were based on a lot, mostly based on fueling the rivalry with Boston and New York and would just go out there with backpacks, you know, full of bumper stickers and like a handheld sign and just sell them to people as they were leaving the stadium. And it was, it was like, it was crazy. I mean, it was, it was an opportunity that that was so much more, uh, fruitful than what I was doing for my day job. The first night I went outside Fenway, I made more money than I had in the past two weeks at my day job. That's so crazy. Yeah. It was just, you know, it was just an opportunity to try and, uh, make some money from, you know, someplace else and then funnel it into the label. So every day I was taking whatever I had made the night before and putting it into, um, paying for bands in the studio, ordering posters, uh, pressing expenses, and, you know, advertisements. Um, it just became a, a, a really incredible way to kind of bankroll what I was trying to do with music. That's crazy. And now you've taken it so far, you're in Target stores, isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, came, we uh, connected with Target a few years ago. They gave us a almost a sh- like a showroom, kind of a store within a store at their Fenway location. Um, we've bounced around some of the other Boston area stores and have, you know, a presence in a few of them, but the, they, they gave us, was rough, I think it was around 400 square feet um, of space in the, in the store right next to Fenway Park, which was really cool. That's crazy. And the way that came about, I know you, you go over that in the, in the dock, in the Don't Stand in Line dock. So, We'll get too much into that, but that, that's definitely a good story. But like, I remember those, most of the sports sh- shirts looked like back then and they were nothing really like what you guys are doing today. There was a lot of like, kind of like bubble print, weird, weird shirts. Do you feel like there was a link there between hardcore and the style that was popular in hardcore and what you started doing with the Sully stuff? Like, I, I think that in hardcore, you're you learn to be outspoken 
and you know kind of in your face and that's what those earlier t-shirts were they were simple a lot of them were crude mostly because you needed you know I mean, th- consider the time and, and the context of when, when a lot of this was happening in the early 2000s. You know, Boston really hadn't won anything, certainly hadn't won a World Series in 86 years. People were, were pissed off. Um, fans were just over it. So you had to really get something that they would stop and, and laugh at to, you know, in order to get them to buy it. And so earlier on i mean things were more kind of in your face but they were really simple they were just one color ink on white t-shirts whatever the cheapest t-shirt we could buy um there wasn't really a lot of thought beyond somebody impulsively buying it you know you didn't really think it was going to be something that would go into their weekly rotation t-shirt wise right right and i think at that time that rivalry was so intense like I mean, I was the most casual of baseball fans, like really not a baseball fan at all. But even I was like following things and and on board with anything that, that it was anti-Yankees. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, it, it, so the Yankees, the anti-Yankees sentiment, uh, really what it did was it unified Boston fans. You know, yes. it's, you want to unify yourself like you want to be unified behind something positive. Um, but back then it was, it was almost like the precursor to Red Sox nation. I mean, a couple of years later, the Red Sox formed Red Sox nation and made this, uh, kind of effort to reach out to fans that were Boston fans all over the country. And, and I, I feel like that had already been done through Yankee suck. Yankee suck unified all the Boston fans and, Mm -hmm. and then they kind of tried to piggyback on that. Right. It was just kind of like the dark side of the the team spirit or the, yeah. yeah, but it was, it was definitely infectious. Did you take more from bridge nine and put it into Sully's or was it more the other way around? Or do you feel like that was kind of like a, a mix of the two? You know, it's been interesting. It's, I've kind of learned a little bit from both sides and things that Sully's has done has influenced bridge nine and vice versa. You know, we'll come up with a new merchandise item like, you know, a good example for us were the the flags and like the banners that we make for both brands. We initially started making Believe in Boston flags back in I think 2006 was when we first made those flags. These you know big five foot wide flags, and I remember I got them in for for Sully's and they were doing well. And I was looking at them and I thought, you know, I should start putting band logos or or making you know a band um, like branded kind of centric flag because if i could have had a sick of it all flag when i was in high school i would have gone nuts you know i i I had tapestries when i was in middle school going back to like led zeppelin and um you know bands like iron maiden or danzig and metallica would have these tapestries but there was not anything like that in hardcore and punk and kind of at that level so a year or two later after the the first ones came out for Sully's, I started doing them for for Bridge Nine, and it became one of our most popular merch items for years. You know, they've they've kind of chilled out now. Um, I think as our audience has gotten older, they have less places to put um, a flag or something like that. But you know, 10, 12 years ago, when more fans were in college or you know in their first apartment with just a bunch of other people. Um, they were like the go-to merch item. Yeah. Yeah. I never thought about that. I, I guess that would be a little, uh, it's a little different scenario when you're, you're, you're married with kids yeah, and exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, you might be able to put it in the basement or the garage. So yeah, obviously like one of the reasons I wanted to have you on was because you're involved in the, the docuseries that don't stand in line. But what I, I was curious, cause I, you obviously, I know like you responded really quickly and you seemed really psyched to be involved, but honestly, I'm sure you were kind of, you had your doubts. Like you probably didn't know exactly what to expect. Um, what, what were you thinking when I, when I first approached you about that? Well, when you first hit me up about doing it, I, I, I kind of saw it as like a day in the life. Um, 
an opportunity to to show people what goes on both between Sully's and Bridge Nine and also my personal life because, you know, you hung out with us at breakfast with my daughter and went to the office with us. So, like, I just thought it was going to be an opportunity to kind of see what myself and, and other small business owners kind of do in their day to day. Um, I think it's it, it's proven to be a really cool opportunity to to do that, but also to to show people, you know, that. I don't. I, I don't. I don't know what people, how people perceive Bridge Nine and me and 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 the brands. I know oftentimes they think when you're at a level at like say what Bridge Nine's at, like it's hard to see behind the brand and 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 just you, you think things are so much bigger than they are, um, and they're so much more corporate or structured. And you know, I think having you come and hang out is a good way to show people that it's still very, very, very DIY. Um, there's so many things that, you know, I know I personally have my hands on, um, every day, but it's just also an opportunity to see how, you know, it's, it's still very grassroots and, and it's attainable. It's something that, um, what I'm doing every day, pretty much anyone could do if they just put the effort in and, you know, granted, I, I've had some pretty cool opportunities, and um, I think there was like a, a bunch of different things that kind of had to happen around the same time for me to ha- have the opportunities that I've had kind of open up um, and be pursuable. But it's, I, th- I think it's a good opportunity for someone to just see, you know, that it's if you put a lot of effort in, a lot of work, you can follow whatever it is your passion is and, and, and make it what you're, you know, what you do for a living. Yeah. I mean, you're obviously someone, I don't know if you heard the phrase, you make your own luck, but you're definitely a good example of that because yeah, there's, I'm sure there's some luck involved, but, but when things come up, if you're not ready to to jump on them, it, it doesn't matter. So yeah. you, you're still going to miss that. That's, and, uh, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's not so much luck, it's just recognizing an opportunity and acting on it. You know, there's been a lot of things that I've, I mean, I've had opportunities that I've, I've slept on and you just never know what door that could have opened. And, or maybe you see somebody else that jumped on that opportunity and the success they've had. Um, but you know, for me, it's, it's, I've had some very cool things happen, but it was timing. It was, a door opening and and actually walking through it. Yeah. Like, I mean, a good example of that is something that happened just recently, like way after we, we filmed with the, the whole Conan O'Brien thing. Do you want to, you want to talk about that a little bit, like how that all came about? Yeah. Well, I mean, so that happened, that was like two weeks into the pandemic, you know, I'm facing, um, every, I mean, put yourself in, I mean, for me, this was, you know, March going into April, um, every event that I would be selling at for Sully's, uh, whether it's a sporting event or the St. Patrick's Day Parade, we would have a presence at um, here in Boston. Um, Red Sox games, we would have vendors out at. We would have people selling outside of like you know the Garden in Boston where the Bruins and Celtics play. Um, all of those things went away, and. It was still pretty cold. There wasn't many drivers for people to want to buy T-shirts online, um, which is what Sully's primarily sells. I mean, we sell a lot of different things, but T-shirts are the bread and butter. Um, And so I just saw all these um, opportunities going away. So I thought, you know what? Like everybody is stuck. Like literally everybody is just – they're stuck at their house. They're sheltering in place, you know, when everything was shutting down. Um, that means pretty much everybody that I would ever want to send an unsolicited care package to is going to be at home probably. And they're not going to have a lot of things to do. So, you know, I'll randomly send care packages to Boston centric A listers and B listers. Um, I've done that over the years. And, um, I just saw it as an opportunity to, to, to send something, you know, a few t-shirts, a little note saying, Hey, um, 
I hope you're staying safe during the pandemic. Thought you'd want, you know, a little something from Boston. And I, I sent some t-shirts to Conan O'Brien. Um, not, you know, not expecting really anything. I think I thought maybe best case I'd see him wearing one in an Instagram story or something fleeting. And I didn't, I mean, so what basically what happened was I sent him a t-shirt with the Zakem bridge design. The Zakem bridge is like a, it's a good looking bridge that, um, a lot of people when referencing Boston will work kind of the, the design of it into, you know, like a cityscape design of Boston. Right. And, uh, but it was built in like 15 years after Conan O'Brien, who's a Boston native, um, moved to the West coast in like the eighties. And that wasn't built until like 15 years after he moved. So, you know, I sent this, this shirt and, and a few other things. And, and then all of a sudden, um, he started making, he, it popped up in one of his, uh, monologues on one of his filmed from home episodes and he just made fun of it. And it was great. I mean, it was, it was funny. Um, he, he raised a couple of valid points, but he said, you know, Sully's, if you wanted to remind me of my childhood, send me a t-shirt of my dad knocking a hot dog out of my hand because Jim Rice missed a fly ball or dropped a fly ball, uh, at, at Fenway park. And, you know, very, very, very specific, and right. so an example of what we were just talking about, seeing an opportunity, um, anybody else could have been like, oh, ha, you know, he posed, he, he, he made fun of the shirt. That's great. Um, and that would be the end of it. But yeah. immediately I was like, oh, Jesus, I need to make that T-shirt. So I, I looked up a um, caricature artist in, that, that works at Fenway. And again, a lot of people were out of work, you know, or, or they weren't really doing much. So I, I hit him up and I said, Hey, uh, I sent him a link to the video. Um, can, can you help me draw this? Can you, can, we need to create this and, but I need it like today. So within, I think it was within 24 hours, uh, the gentleman that I, that I hired, um, drew the design, captured the likeness perfectly. Um, I, I pieced it together into a t-shirt and then printed some the next day and next day aired it to Conan O'Brien. And within, uh, within an hour of it receiving, of him receiving it at his house, he, he emailed me through his assistant and was just blown away. He was like, I, a, I, I can't believe you made this. Um, but you, it's like, it, I, I, how do you know what my dad looked like? Because it's perfect. And <laughs> Yeah, so he was he was like he thought it was great, and he said I'm definitely going to mention this and, and feature this in my monologue on on Monday. So I just wanted to let you know and thank you. And That's amazing. He, yeah, and he said, oh, by the way, is there any you know, I I know that you know you're a small business. Is there any way, um, you know that you could that I can help you out? And so I ended up directing him to a charity uh, affiliated with the Red Sox and said, if you want to make a donation, uh, he, he actually came back and said he was donating $10,000, which was wow. crazy. Um, but yeah, so we, we, we made the, you know, we, we made the shirt, uh, sent to him. He made fun of, you know, he made, he, he referenced making fun of the other one and then just gushed about this new one. And we put it on our website and it wasn't crazy. I mean, we sold a few hundred of them. Um, which was super cool, uh, yeah, and a huge yeah. bump during that period, you know, when we had like nothing else going on. Right. Um, right. And, and, and I have to say the Conan O'Brien staff were incredibly cool about it. They, um, not only obviously promoted the shirt, but usually they would, they would not plug anybody, right. They would just say, Oh, look at this t-shirt and not mention the name of the brand. Not only did they drop name drop Sully's a bunch of times, um, but they also linked the t-shirt that we were selling um, from their official like social media. So it, it, it really was, they, they went out of their way to help us. Um, and, and during a very weird, quiet time for us, uh, it was, it was cool. And then of course we got local press that covered it, you know, a couple different newspapers and, and, a and a, a TV show that, that put little spots about us and, and how Conan, um, had talked about us, uh, in their coverage. So that was cool. Hearing that he actually contact, contacted, contacted, you directly and did all that, you know, donating to the charity. That's, you know, a lot of information I wasn't aware of. It was just, it makes you think a little differently about them and, you know, what you can actually get done if you just, you know, go for it. Um, 
Yeah. You, I mean, you yeah. just have to put yourself out there. I mean, obviously you don't want to be annoying, but like you, you just gotta, you know, you just gotta just try and, and, and get outside of, you know, a, there's a lot of things where people say, Oh, wouldn't it be funny if you did this or, Oh, wouldn't, and, and they don't do it. Right. Um, and I try to, to, to see it through and, you know, it doesn't always work. Um, I mean, I sent a bunch of care packages to people that never acknowledged it and never, um, you know, uh, but, but the, the ones that do can be pretty awesome. Sully's gear makes up 90% of Ben Affleck's, uh, attire <laughs> these days. Yeah, that was, that was certainly cool. I mean, we've, we've, um, so Ben Affleck has repped Sully's in a few different ways over the and years. Bridge nine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well that, so, you know, he, we of course were featured, uh, pretty prominently, uh, Sully's brand was, had a few, uh, I think actually six different t-shirts, two of them pretty prominently, uh, were featured in his movie, the town. Um, and we worked closely with the costume uh, designer for that movie and so when I was sending out these care packages, um, during the pandemic, I, I, I threw a couple of t-shirts to Ben Affleck. And since it's the 10th anniversary of the town, um, just said, Hey, you know, you, you repped our brand in your film and, um, in, you know, in the town and it was very cool of you. And, and we've, uh, we've never forgotten that. So, you know, basically thank you and, and, and hope you're staying safe during the pandemic. And, um, I think I threw, you know, four t-shirts in it and he, he wore all four of them like over the next two weeks, just out with his girlfriend going to Dunkin' Donuts or walking their dogs. And, um, you know, that was another thing where it was nothing crazy, but like every, every time he wore it, we'd get a bunch of orders for it and for whatever it was he was wearing. And, um, you know, it was, it was just cool. Yeah. It was just, it's just crazy how it, it, it's like every time he had a photo taking of taken of him he was wearing either sully's or bridge nine gear yeah well you know it's it's funny i i have uh the first photo of him wearing sully's gear was back in 2004 he wore a killing with shillin t-shirt that we made and uh there's a picture of him like in people magazine like at, you know in the stands at fenway and he's like showing off the shirt so mm. you know there's been between that and then of course you know all the, the t-shirts in the town and um, it's kind of been a neat little kind of, I don't know. It just, it's just been cool of them. Yeah. I mean, that, that's basically, it's kind of on the line, along the lines of the, of guerrilla marketing, which like pretty much like, as far as I'm concerned, you're, you're a master of that. I mean, <laughs> thank you. Um, I mean, just going back from the beginning, like I, like the whole, and you want to tell a little bit, like just briefly about like what you did at the beginning of bridge nine with the, with the BU bridge in Boston? Sure. Well, so when you've, you know, when you're working a basically minimum wage job, um, and you're trying to build awareness for something, there is no extra money. So you have to resort to, or at least I did had to resort to guerrilla marketing where it's just putting your stuff out there, um, on a street level, uh, for a very few dollars, but in a way that a lot of people can see it and hopefully, you know, build awareness for whatever it is you're promoting. And the way I did that in the nineties was initially by, um, altering billboards. I would, I would print out bridge nine in like these eight or 10 foot wide sheets of paper. And then I would go and wheat paste them onto a billboard. Uh, uh one of them that, that got a lot of kind of play was there was i think at the time it was like a garfield um got milk uh billboard and it so it, it said like it said nine nutrients nine lives um and then it said got milk really big with the question mark in that kind of stylized font so i printed um bridge nine with a question mark and then we pasted that over the got milk and you know this was on top of some I don't know, two or three story building on a busy road in the Boston area. And I had to climb up there at two in the morning and, and kind of hang off the side of the, you know, the, the top of the building to, to wheat paste it. But it was up for months. And it was one of those things where not most people didn't get it, didn't even recognize it. But the people that knew what Bridge Nine was or that it was on their radar really, really kind of resonated with them. So right. I was, you know, I would do stuff like that. I would, you know, you of course do like the stickering where you go and, um, 
post up stickers all over the place promoting your brand or promoting whatever it is you're you're doing. Um, but the one that we go into in in the documentary series is the one we when I painted the the BU bridge, and that was you know like an all night uh, solo mission. I had a friend of mine uh, drive and drop me off with. Uh, a five gallon bucket of white paint, a couple gallons of black paint, a bunch of rollers and literally just shimmied across, you know, in the middle of the night, one summer night from maybe one in the morning till the sun came up just at first whitewashing the entire side of the bridge. Cause this is a bridge that's pretty well known for being covered in graffiti. Um, so I went whitewashed all the panels uh, along the, like the side of the bridge facing Boston. And then started back at the beginning and just painted one huge block letter, like four foot tall block letter on each panel of this railroad trestle kind of bridge. And, you know, just said, I think bridge nine, you know, DIY BHC 1999 or something. Um, but it was up for, for months and something like 60,000 cars or I don't know, something more, some crazy number of cars drive down store drive through Boston every day. And I mean, all sorts of people saw that. And it was, I mean, it was, you can't pay for that. You, you can't afford that kind of awareness. So, yeah. you know, so that, that's just kind of what I was resorting to back then. And how the, I've seen that bridge up close, obviously, but yep. I, I don't think, I know I wouldn't do that now. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think that's something I ever would have been up for it at three o'clock in the morning, especially were you af afraid at all? Or like, like what, what, what like was kind of going through your head when you were doing it? Were you just like, fuck it, I'm doing, I'm doing well, this. There, there was definitely part, part of it was fuck it, but you know, it's, it was, I, from what I remember, it was, a, it was a nice night, you know, warm out. Um, but obviously I didn't want to fall in the water, which was, I don't know, yeah. 12 or 15 feet below the bridge. Um, because it was pretty pitch black out. Um, while you're doing it, you're obviously worried that you're going to be like somebody's going to stumble upon you, or you know, like you know, either well, that's the other, other thing, yeah, you know, other other people doing graffiti, or like there are people that were doing graffiti, or like, you know, I, there was definitely like a police boat that I saw with a blue light that kind of you know went through the Charles and, um, you know, or just other people, you know, uh, there's kind of a like a little homeless encampment in that area, so you, you just you don't know. Um, but at the time it, it just, I don't know. I think I was, I was also, it, I mean, this was over tw it was 20 years ago. So I was probably not thinking as, um, thinking through as, 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 uh, safely as I would at this point. <laughs> right. Right. But and that actually brings up a point. Of, I I've always wanted to ask, like, especially now, since you're more established and well-known, you're painting the name of your company, basically on, <laughs> on there. And it's obviously probably not the most legal thing. Like, did you ever get any heat for that, for any, any, or that or anything else that you've done? No, not, not really. I mean, I, you know, again, consider what bridge nine in 1999 was three, seven inches and a CD, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and it was mostly known, uh, just in, you know, the back of small, you know, punk shows of as selling like t-shirts and bumper stickers. Um, that that's kind of there, there was, it was, we were so far off the radar that, um, that, you know, people didn't know, you know, we, nobody, you couldn't, I mean, back then, um, I mean, I, we actually did have a website, uh, surprise say. I think the website. Gonna, I'm sorry. I was going to say, yeah, there were also no, there wasn't like Google. You couldn't just go Google yeah, bridge nine you, and you figure couldn't. out who did it. It would, it would obviously the, the internet was a little less uh, developed back then, but I mean, I, we did actually have a website as of 1998. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, Google didn't exist. Right. So, right. you know, whatever search engines probably weren't Yahoo or yeah. cities or something. Yeah. But to answer your question, I mean, there, back then there really wasn't any blowback for, for some of those things. Um, you know, and, and I would do, silly things. Like I remember, um, there was a, so there was a, a Christmas tree that would be set up at like a really big Christmas tree. I think it was actually a gift from, um, a Canadian province that would, they, every year they donate one to Boston. Um, and we're talking like, you know, 
I don't know, 100 foot tall uh, Christmas tree that would be set up in front of the Prudential Center. And back in 99 ish, I would uh, get my hair cut at some like supercuts or something on Boylston Street. And I remember seeing this big tree and it have like the base of the tree was made to look like a gift. That's it's kind of like, you know, like a plywood box that kind of was painted to look like a gift. Yeah. So I went to my, um, I was working at tower records in the basement. I just went and made a huge, like, I don't know, like six foot laminated, uh, gift tag that said from your friends at bridge nine, like big. Oh, wow. And then, and just like, and then just rolled down, you know, it is like, I put like a whole bunch of really thick foam double stick tape on the back of it and just kind of walked up to the side of it and just stuck it on the side of this, this, the, the base of this tree. So anyone walking by would thought, would think like, oh, this tree was given by bridge nine. And I mean, it was just random little things like that, that I was into just because I thought it was funny, but it also right. was an outside of the box way of promoting the brand. That's pretty awesome. I didn't. Even, I never heard about that one. Do you have? Yeah. I hope you have you, pictures of that. I do have. I yeah. do have pictures. I'll have to send you a picture of it. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, a lot of stuff has happened since we finished filming. Um, and I think you've touched on it a little bit, but like, how have you had to kind of ch you know change your operation and and, and what to uh, to adapt to what's happened over the past year? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's. It, the the past seven eight months since all this has happened has has been really difficult. Obviously, for pretty much all small business owners, um, for me, you know, you've got to not only deal with the restrictions. You know, the the there's less people in the office now. Um, you know, we used to have somebody in part time for both Sully's and Bridge Nine every day, and Sully's, I had to let that person go. And with, with bridge nine, that person comes in once, maybe twice a week for a few hours. Mm -hmm. So it's really scaled back. So we have less help, you know, in the office. Um, at the same time, you've got to, you're, you know, you're dealing with trying to navigate things like PPP loans or, um, you know, other, uh, funding, uh, uh, grants, things, things where, you know, you're, you're trying to kind of cover some of your bases so that you can keep employees. Like I, with right. Sully's, I, two of my, my, my two main employees, I have, um, half time right now. We, there's a, the state of Massachusetts has a program where you can basically pay half their salary and then they're on unemployment for the other half. And honestly, that's the only way that I could keep them right now, because while our mail order numbers have been very, very good, you know, people are staying at home, they're mail ordering things like we've been able to come up with um, initiatives to, to, to really get people excited. You know, we did mystery boxes. Um, but while that's helped grow our online sales, it still isn't really helping make up for the fact that, you know, still every event has been canceled. Um, you know, at Target, we we had a great relationship with Target. But we're still operating at like a quarter of where we should be at this year versus previous years. Right. You know, just the sales are just so low because you know there's no games at Fenway, so there's none of these Red Sox fans coming through the, the store on a on a daily basis throughout the summer. You know, there's all the tourists that would be coming, and you know they want to buy something because they went to a game at Fenway. You know, um, all those sales have disappeared. So, you know, and at the same time, you know, you're trying to kind of come up with um, uh, ways to kind of keep people coming in the door. You you have to pivot and, you know, I, and create new products. Um, we, Sully's as a brand deals mainly in intellectual property that we create. And if people are not buying t-shirts, how can we, what, how can we apply those ideas and those designs to things that people will buy? So, you know, at first we started making gate like neck gaiters, you know, for people to cover their faces. Um, I started uh, making puzzles. You know, we made three different puzzles, one for Bridge Nine, one for uh, Sully's, and then one for this kind of art art project that I do um, just to, to offer these things on on products that would be more people would be more into right now because they're stuck at home and, and those they, are that Sorry, that was just such a good idea. Those oh, puzzles. thank you. 
Yeah, it, well, it's funny. The Bridge Nine puzzle was actually an idea prior to COVID, but COVID was like, all right, well, shit. I, you know, right. Pe- puzzles. People are into puzzles right now, and that this is something we've wanted to do. Let's get it done. Um, you know, and and I mean, with the Bridge Nine puzzle, that was the one that I sent you that had like all the vinyl records. You know, of, of that we 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 basically made a collage of every single vinyl release that we've ever had, which is, you know, upwards of 300 titles, but then multiple variants, test pressings, you know, uh, uh, like festival pressings and all all sorts of different colors. That one's so good because if someone who doesn't know anything about Bridge Nine tries to sit down and do it, they're going to be lost because... Yeah. It, you have a huge advantage if you know the records and the, and the titles of the bands, or at least have an idea how band names uh, might be, com- how those words might go yep. together to make a band name. Like, you know what I mean? Because, I mean, it's just such an advantage to know that and, and put that together. Whereas for me, that graveyard one would be impossible. Yeah, um, that one is really tough. Um, but, you know, I, that's the selling point for puzzles. You know, uh, a lot of times people want puzzles that aren't easy. I've, some, one, of, one of the guys in my office was telling me about puzzles that he knew of that were like blank and they were mm. double sided. You know, it's just like, why would anyone wow. ever want to do that to themselves? It's like torture. But, yeah. You want you want to have some satisfaction you know, while you're doing it and seeing it through, you know, and and the uh, that one is tough. But the uh, the bridge nine one and the one that we did for Sully's, we made one that has basically like every bumper sticker that Sully's ever made um, over the the past 20 years I made into a collage and it's cool because it kind of, it, it, it's a lot, obviously a lot of these stickers are long, long out of print, but they, they help tell the story of Boston sports kind of in a way mm. from the Yankee suck days, uh, through to Tom Brady, um, you know, leaving like it's, it's kind of been like a, uh, you know, two decades of, of storylines. And, and so that was kind of how I helped illustrate the Sully's puzzle, but that's the past, you know, six, seven months has been hard because, you know, you're, you're, you're working harder for whatever it is you earn. You're doing it with less people and, and, you know, uh, less help. Um, and, you know, and then on top of that, you're, you're having to wear so many more hats. You're having, you're having to come up with new products, source them, um, and take a risk on ordering them, uh, seeing if people will buy them, you know, uh, like bandanas or something we started making. And that was, you know, again, that was something that I think at one point I thought would be cool and, and it had been on the back burner and then COVID happens. And, you know, now you've got to find a place that makes good quality bandanas and you have to design, you know, come up with concepts and designs that fit a bandana well, um, and then come up with packaging for them. You know, you can't just make a bandana. You have to have like a like a a way to show it at retail. And these were just all things that, you know, I had to kind of problem solve uh, while dealing with every other thing that the pandemic threw at us. Right, right. Um, just want to shift gears a little bit. When we filmed back in, I think that was what was that April, like twenty nineteen. Yeah, I think Seems so. Like, yeah, obviously, it, I don't know. Things 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 have been uh, so crazy between now and then. But after we wrapped, what were you thinking? Like, did it go kind of the way you thought it was going to go? Like, did you have any thoughts about what is going to become of this? You know, because I because I the reason I ask is um, I'm interested to know what all you guys really thought because. Some of the questions I asked weren't even really questions. It was just kind of like throw a word at you and wait to see what you, how you would respond. (laughs) Because I was just trying to keep it really open ended. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it was like, like I said, it was a, it was obviously a pleasure hanging out with you because as somebody that I've known for, you know, twenty something years, uh, we haven't had a lot of time to kind of hang out over the last decade, and so just spending time with you was really nice. But it was just, it was cool to. I don't know, like just let people see how that the, the workday flows um, when you're doing something like Bridge Nine and Sully's. And, you know, it was nice that you were able to go down to Fenway with me and, you know, see working with vendors that we have down at the Fenway, at the, down at Games, but also all the things that 
were involved with just making sure the merchandise was out and being back in my office and uh, dealing with the T-shirts being printed. I mean, there was there was like multiple levels of 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 each thing that we deal with, both at the label and at Sully's that you kind of got to document. So, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, that brings up another thing. Like, do you find it difficult to just go from one side of the business to you? to the other? Cause it, it doesn't seem like you did. It seems like you, you do it pretty seamlessly. I think it's something that I've built up a tolerance to. Um, I, I'm sure in business school, they would tell you to compartmentalize things. And, and, you know, I'm sure if I did Sully's in the morning and bridge nine in the afternoon, maybe I'd have a little bit more structure and I'd be able to handle things more efficiently. But for me, I just, I weave back and forth between the two, um, throughout the day and I'll, just whatever needs to be addressed at, at any moment, I'll, I'll deal with kind of a, on a case-by-case basis. Um, again, I don't know if it's the, the, the best way to do it, but it's kind of been the, the way that I've the, – the, that's kind of how my muscle memory is at this point where I, it's kind of how I know how to tackle things. Hmm. No, that's, that totally makes sense. I mean, I honestly, I kind of do the same thing just from a desk though, you know, because <laughs> I'm, I'm working – you know, I – different things all day long and you just mm-hmm. sometimes you just have to handle them as they come up after seeing the completed project what did you think as far as you know and i'm not really not really like oh it was good or whatever but like did you think it did it convey the what you thought it was going to convey yeah it well it was cool to see how each of the other stories was weaved in you know i are when we worked on it or when, when you kind of were working on it with me, you were documenting what I was doing. And and I saw just kind of how my day was kind of, kind of unveiled through your lens. And then, but seeing how my stories and kind of compliments and kind of is weaved through with, you know, everyone else that's involved in it. It's just, it's, it was just very cool to see that. I mean, I obviously, uh, you hit it out of the park, I think, with this, and I, I'm I'm really excited to see how people respond to it. Thank but you. Um, yeah, it, but it's also just really cool to see, um, you know, what I do ultimately isn't while while what my particular like product, you know, and efforts are are very specific. Um, the motivation, the passion, the uh, work ethic that needs to go into it isn't unique to me. And it's, it's really cool to see other people, um, who have similar passions put in, in, in a similar work ethic, kind of see, see what they've been able to create and, and kind of what makes things tick behind the scenes. So I, I think this is a very cool, uh, way to, to show people how, you know, each of us, uh, kind of tick and, and, and create considering everything that's gone down in the last year and like, you know, obviously things have gotten harder and, and just different. You're like, got to be in a, a little bit of a different headspace than you were a, a year and a half ago. Do you feel like you have any different opinions than you might've had then on anything? I don't, I don't know if I have any, if my opinions have changed on anything over the past year or, you know, since we sat down, but, um, I think that if anything, this year has has um, kind of shown that, you know, if you put your head down and, and you really kind of just, I don't know, just put the effort in or just try. I, one one compliment I've been given a couple of times was that I've, I, I'm able to box myself out of most corners. You know, I've had some pretty crazy things thrown at me over the years that I've been able to problem solve and, and, and kind of fight through. And, and this is just, I, this year has just been, uh, that on steroids for pretty much everybody. Um, but it, you know, a, I think it's just having, a uh, having a, having that focus that you need to persevere, um, staying close to friends and family and, um, uh, you know, being able to rally the support that you need to, to get through. Um, I think that's, if anything has been, um, 
this year has been just kind of like seeing how people can help each other, um, whether it's by cross promoting or collaborating. Um, I don't know. I think that's, that's what I've, that's been my takeaway for this year. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I think that's the message I think that came across from all of you is almost that much more relevant now. It's like everything you said should just be doubled down on, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's really what's going to get you through. And you can, I, I could definitely see it. I, you know, I, I can tell you're hustling. There's no way that you're, you're taking many days off these days. So that being said, like what, what it, are you currently working on? Is there anything that's like really keeping you motivated or? Yeah. So, so like the, well, with, with bridge nine, this year being our 25th anniversary, that has, has been, um, something that I've kind of tried to, um, re, uh, kind of what's the word I'm looking for. I, you know, I've been kind of remixing old merch and, and working on reissues of some, classic releases that we've done over the years and you know really just obviously you don't hit 25 years very often when you're a small business so i've wanted to kind of just work on things that commemorate that and commemorate the 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 history that we have with a lot of these artists um you know we were supposed to have a big show just like i think a lot of people were supposed to do cool things this year and and obviously that that went away um so i'm trying to find different ways that i can um i guess showcase that, uh, without it being in person and, you know, being an event. Um, the, the, the big thing that I'm dealing with right now is our, our office is, uh, up it's in limbo right now. Um, over the, the summer we had our landlord tell us that they were going to sell the building and they had, they've, they've even recently, as recently as last month, they had, uh, somebody that they were walking through to kind of show the place off and, talking about all the sell, you know, the selling points that the work that they had put into the building over the years. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've just been spent, I've literally spent since the summer trying to, to nail down a new location to move, uh, the businesses. Um, right now it's looking like it might be in Beverly. I, ha- I have a spot that I'm, you know, nine tenths of the way there. Um, but you know, even then it might not be until after the new year, but you know, it's, it's just, it's on top of everything else, like trying to troubleshoot that. Like I, it's, it's really been, you know, moving is one of the most difficult things that they say people go yeah. through, um, in life, you know, it's, I think it's up there with divorce and, and, uh, and other things. Moving's and, terrible. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a nightmare. And I mean, try moving 10,000 square feet of stuff and office and warehouse yeah you know, and, and shelves and inventory. And it's, it's a nightmare, but, and thankfully not one that we've had to do very often. I mean, the last time we moved was in 2007. So it's been 13 years. Um, but so yeah, that's, that's kind of been the the biggest thing that I've been dealing with. And of course we're facing all sorts of other, ex, you know, expenses, uh, connected to that. Um, so we've asked people since the summer, like, Hey, if basically if there's something that you've wanted to check out, please don't sit on the fence, come over and grab it. Um, every sale, uh, is helping us. Cause I mean, just in the past few months, I've had to hire an engineer, an architect, um, a lawyer just to, to kind of navigate this, this new building, uh, you know, effort that we're, that we're putting in. So, um, it's, it's been an expensive, uh, fall and, and summer in a year that was already financially really tough. So, you know, that's, that's it. Just, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll figure it out and we'll get through it. Um, and, and thankfully people have been super, super supportive and responsive and, um, have, you know, been checking out some of the stuff we've been releasing to kind of help support it. So I know with the 25th anniversary, you obviously couldn't do that show this year, but any, any plans on trying to do something like that next year? I th- honestly, I think it's just kind of in a, a holding pattern right now. Um, I know bands are booking things uh, for next summer, but I don't think there's a lot of, um, you know, I, I, I don't think people are really secure in, in the, the thought that that's actually going to happen. Yeah, man, I, I, I'm going to let you go. But is there anything like any last words you want to say about 
anything at all or like obviously like if you have something to, to plug or where, wherever people can find you that type of thing yeah i mean you know like, like i mentioned if uh i know with with bridge nine we're, we're really hustling and trying to raise some money so check out b9store.com we have i mean obviously a bunch of stuff from from all of our bands and we're remixing some of our old merch and coming up with cool new like uh, commemorative things that to kind of acknowledge 25 years. So certainly check that out. Um, if you're into Boston sports or anything, Boston centric, Sully's brand.com is kind of where we, you know, all the, the, the Sully's Boston centric sports stuff is. So if you want to dress like Ben Affleck, check that out. Um, you know, bridge nine is our, our socials. I think those are pretty easy to find. Um, but you know, just, I thank you again for including me in, in this, this project. Um, and, I'm just, I don't know. I'm, ex- I'm excited to see how people respond to the the documentary. I think that you put an incredible amount of work into it. Like it's, it's not what I think anyone might've expected. You know, they, it's, it's just, it's like, it's, it's just a really interesting viewpoint, I think, to, to kind of follow, uh, each of us. And, and I, I think that, um, I don't know, I, I appreciate being included and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how people react to it. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for doing it. And thank you for doing this. And uh, yeah, just thank you. And we'll talk to you again soon. That sounds good. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Chris. Thanks again for listening. If you get a chance, please leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this. It really helps build awareness and it would mean a lot to me. Also, don't forget to check out the six-part Don't Stand in Line docuseries. You can learn more about it and everything else we're working on at codecprojects.com. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Codec Projects. That's Codec Projects, C-O-D-E-C-P-R-O-J-E-C-T-S.com. See you next week. Don't sweat.